transcendentalism, and in partic particular the role nature plays as understood by Henry David Thoreau. At this point, I also want to first acknowledge that while the bulk of the mes my message is composed of my own thoughts, I've also borrowed pieces about transcendentalism from a sermon delivered by Brian Mason that was posted for use on the UUA.org website, and a few filler pieces of Thoreau's life gleaned from the Thoreau Society's website, and a little bit from Wikipedia. <laughs> I'm no expert. If you know anything about Thoreau, it probably has something to do with Walden Pond or his writings on civil disobedience. But for me, as importantly, he articulated one of the greatest defenses for preserving the, natural, the splendor of the natural world, the notion that we need the tonic of wildness. As you saw in A Time for All Ages, Henry David Thoreau was an adventurer, a philosopher of nature and its relation to the human condition. His writings on solitude are worthy of additional consideration, particularly during this time of COVID. I first came to understand that solitude, especially the kind experienced in nature, as Sigurd Olson so wonderfully observed in the opening words, to be listening points, places that, including, that for some, including Thoreau, might even be called holy. The photos that I shared in the Loon Meditation represent some of my own listening points, spaces where I became aware and still, or I ha had to work very persistently in places like the Boundary Waters, um, the Wisconsin River for my, our Stevens Point Fellowship people. There is a, there's a photo in there that was right outside of Stevens Point. Or the waterways of the Northern Forest Canoe Trail, or footpaths that cannot connect mountain ranges and cross state lines. Each of us have our own version of listening points. Contemplative awe can be experienced observing nuthatches plucking sunflower seeds from a backyard feeder, or standing by your front door watching as the street fills with snow and the sounds of the city become muffled, or watching a baby sleep or a dog dream. Listening points don't have to occur exclusively, exclusively in wilderness settings, but for today, I am focusing on the individual curiosity and wonder that the natural world sparks. One of my earliest memories of contemplative awe, described by people like Sigurd Olson and Henry David Thoreau, occurred on an early childhood camping trip. Dragging an aluminum lawn chair across the sand of our shoreline campsite, I joined my dad at the edge of Shell Lake in northern Wisconsin, sitting quietly beneath the brilliantly illuminated Milky Way, dark waves lapping gently at our feet. There was far less light pollution in the late 1960s, and I don't think I felt ever as though I've ever seen so many stars, so numerous or bright before, or probably since. Just imagine today being able to look up into the night sky without seeing hundreds of satellites, satellites that carry the mixed blessing of penetrating into every corner of our lives. I first came to understand the concept of transcendentalism through a Master's of Liberal Arts class I took at St. Norbert College in the spring of 2020 right as the pandemic was beginning to reshape our attitude about solitude. The course entitled Singles and Couplets had been planned well before COVID was finding its way around the world, and the, our discussions took on a new meaning as we spent more and more time in forced isolation. The story of transcendentalism is distinctly American, one that grew out of the 19th century romanticist thought. It's a story that began with an idea, an idea that there are some things to life that are true without need for evidence. For example, the transcendentalist looked to the world and observed that no one had to give you a formal lesson on the uses and purposes of a chair. You just knew that your bottom likes to sit on things from time to time. And no one gave you a formal lesson on the various features of a human hand. You knew it had the ability to feed you, scratch an itch, or feel around in the dark. And no one told you to look up in the night sky in awe you're not instructed to feel small or strange or enlivened or moved standing at the rim of the Grand Canyon, at the base of a giant redwood tree, or from the shore of some vast northern lake. It's as if you've known these things all along. Transcendentalists held the notion that an ideal spiritual state transcends or goes beyond the physical and the empirical, and that one achieves insight through personal intuition rather than a religious doctrine. On July 4, 1845, Henry David Thoreau moved into his cabin near Concord, Massachusetts. For two years and two months, he lived alone in what others have called an experiment in isolation. Writing from the confines of his, 19, of his 10 by 15 foot single room on Walden Pond, or as one contemporary author likes to observe, America's original social distancer, Thoreau said, 
I went into the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life. Moving to Walden served two purposes. One, to write his first book, and two, to conduct an economic experiment. Thoreau wanted to see if it was possible to live by working one day and devoting the other six to more transcendental concerns, thus reversing the Yankee habit of working six days and resting one. Some people would say that his experiment was elitist. He wasn't truly isolated, he never completely removed himself from society, and he also had the means and leisure to, to spend hours thinking and writing something that's unattainable to most people then and yet today. But Thoreau's attempt to simplify wasn't just about contemplating the rising sun and the trees of the forest. It was for him just as much about trying to live a moral life. We spend our whole lives wanting more, never figuring out the basic arithmetic, Thoreau states, continuing, we would be better off finding a way to be content with less. Thoreau viewed technology as often unnecessary distractions. He saw the practical benefits of the new inventions, but he also warned that these innovations couldn't address the real challenges of personal happiness. And, adding prophetically, our inventions are wont to be pretty toys which distract our attention from serious things. Thoreau was clearly a person ahead of his time, and on the drive over here I was listening to the tragically hip Ahead by a Century, which he fits. <laughs> he not only predicted the impact of social media before that was a thing, he also invented the tiny house movement. <laughs> Just that it was 200 years before it's time to catch on. In many ways, we have been forced into some version of Walden and Thoreau's experiment in social distancing. We've been living in a metaphorical cabin now for a while, an on-again, off-again retreat going on for more than two years. Under other conditions, what we have needed to do in order to protect our health and the health of those around us might look like a retreat, like a retreat for reconnecting, unplugging, and recharging. A retreat as a place of renewal generally represents a break from our usual stresses, but of course, our responses to this forced retreat can differ significantly. Like Thoreau, the ability to weather isolation is strongly influenced by individual demographics, economics, and health, not to mention that the pandemic has been found to be infinitely harder on extroverts than introverts. We all need connection, so finding a way to connect while protecting ourselves and others is crucial. In a January 2021 New York Times article entitled Lockdown Was Our Breaking Point, French author Monique Alfazi discusses the challenges of living within the confines of her Parisian apartment with her younger husband during the COVID lockdown of 2020. She writes, thrill seeking and passion can only take a marriage so far. And now that we were living as a family, reality had set in. As the days wore on, her husband's self-isolation grew to feel less benign. And after weeks of enduring passive aggressive post-it notes, during which time he had barricaded himself in the guest room, Alfazi's patience was exhausted and she confronted her husband. To her surprise, she learned the confinement had allowed him to catch his breath. He hadn't been stewing in anger in the spare room as she had thought. Solitude provided respite. Researchers Christopher Long and James Averill agree. In their 2003 behavioral study, Solitude and Exploration of the Benefits of Being Alone, they report, solitude is a state char characterized by disengagement from the immediate demands of other people, a state of reduced social inhibition and increased freedom to select one's mental or physical activities. Historically, philosophers, artists, and spiritual leaders have extolled the benefits of solitude. Transformative figures, including Jesus, Buddha, and Gandhi, each sought time apart from others for reflection and for renewal. In contrast to loneliness, solitude is often a positive state, one that might be sought rather than avoid, avoided. In other words, carving out time for oneself is freeing. Thoreau left Walden in 1846 in order to travel to northern Maine for the first of three trips that would ultimately help define his philosophy. Thoreau was an early advocate of, the, of outdoor recreation, of conserving natural resources on private land, and of preserving wilderness as public land. He himself was a highly skilled canoeist. His expectations traveling to Maine were high because he hoped to find genuine primeval America. 
but contact with real wilderness in Maine affected him far differently than had the idea of wilderness in Concord. Instead of coming out of the woods with a deepened appreciation of the wilds, Thoreau felt a greater respect for civilization and realized the necessity of balance. This past summer, I carved out 44 days, paddling more than 700 miles in, the, in a solo canoe on the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. I love the physical challenge and the persistent self-reliance demanded by solo adventures. And following squiggly lines on a map with no place that I needed to be is most definitely freeing. The water trail begins in the Adirondacks in Old Forge, New York, and passes through Vermont, Quebec, New Hampshire, and ends at the top of Maine in Fort Kent. I've paddled this trail before in sections and in its entirety, but always with other people. Maine accounts for almost half of the Northern Forest Canoe Trail, the last 160 miles following the same waters Thoreau paddled. Thoreau can't be credited for making the first or even the longest trips in this part of the world. And in fact, I actually paddled this section a whole lot faster than he did and had a lot less gear. But Thoreau left, what behind, left behind what is considered the best written, inspiring, and most widely known account in his book, The Maine Woods. Like an Old Testament prophet, he warned us to protect natural places as wellsprings of human inspiration and wonderment. Now, although I have acquired quite a number of stories over the years, unexplained situations of intuition, chance encounters with wildlife, and a really outlandish one where I spent the night as a guest, uh, twice actually, 10 years apart, as a guest of M. Emmett Walsh, who is an actor best known for his character roles in movies like The Jerk, he was a sniper with Steve Martin in there, or as the father of the bride in the Julia Roberts film, My Best Friend Wedding. But that, these are stories that have to be saved for another time. <laughs> the story I'm going to share with you from this summer's trip is a little bit less thrilling, but it, come, it, it speaks to the transcendental power shared by other human souls, and it comes from the same part of the world that Thoreau traveled. So after spending the, mostly, uh, the previous mostly uninspiring day paddling, in cold, damp, overcast skies for 27 miles in a day that lacked zero moose sightings in an area where I should have seen many, I decided to stop at the village at Chesuncook Lake. When Thoreau visited Chesuncook in the mid-1800s, it was only a small settlement and it, it, that had sprung up to support the lumber industry. Over the years, a hotel, a general store, a post office, and a school were built and by 1920, the village had grown to 247 residents. Steamboats brought supplies and tourists through the 1950s. But after the timber harvest ceased, what little remained of the city then was placed on the National, historic, uh, National Regist Register of Historic Places in 1973. Living in Chesun Cook today demands persistence. The village is still only accessible by the means of a 60-mile dirt road that takes three hours to drive, or a 17-mile boat ride from the nearest boat launch, or by paddling the Northern Forest Canoe Trail and entering via the West Branch Penobscot River, which is how I arrived on July 11th. When I first visited the village a decade earlier, there was reportedly less than 10 permanent residents. I had met the proprietor of the store, a white clapboard house where a then 80-year-old man and one of the few remaining inhabitants served homemade fudge and root beer to visitors. I hadn't explored the rest of the historic village on that trip, and this time I wanted to see more. Leaving the canoe and all my belongings on the beach, I headed to the church that housed the village museum, one of the few original buildings still standing. A handwritten note on the open wood door reminded visitors that a 10 a.m. service would be held, which is then that I realized it was Sunday morning, <laughs> and the service was less than an hour from now. And while I was wandering through the cemetery, observing an extraordinarily high number of 19th century headstones listing the names of the single men who had perished working the log drives, the church bell tolled. And so I stayed for the service. Within the unheated, knotty pine-walled, white steepled church, we listened to the visiting minister talk about his work in prison ministry, and in a very Walden-esque off-the-grid twist, the minister even played the pump organ, belting out a familiar Methodist hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, all nine of us joining in. <laughs> Introductions were made, it was casual and friendly, not unlike our own UU services. And most people in attendance had been in the village visiting friends or relatives for the week and had shared fond memories stopping by the store to buy treats. 
Peter, a round man with a bum knee and a booming personality, was one of the seasonal residents. He had owned the log, he owned the log hewn lodge that was near the beach where I left my gear. Peter had sat behind me at the back of the sanctuary, and after the service, he offered me the use of his solar-powered Wi-Fi or anything else I needed, toilet paper, and then the magic words, or a shower. Now, I had been chilled for the past three days and was feeling particularly grungy having walked through a mud flap to load up the canoe that morning. Do I really pop in to take a late morning shower after a church service from a complete stranger? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I ended up spending most of my day in Chesung Cook. After taking my solar heated shower, I was invited then to stay for lunch. I met John, who was busy helping to assemble the meal. John had also been in attendance at the church service and turned out to be one of the two remaining Chesung Cook permanent residents. He's in his 30s and he makes his living taking care of the area ca cabins or camps as they're called in Maine, cutting lawns in the summer, shoveling snow in the winter. He says he is far from lonely. He keeps tabs on the other town resident, one of the last of the generation, and people like Peter visit their camps year-round. Rarely a week goes by without a dinner invitation. And like Thoreau, John claims to never have found a companion that was so companionable as solitude. I didn't stay long enough or know John well enough, to, but it certainly appears he, he, he is choosing a, to live a life with intention. People miss the point that going into the woods is about lo isn't about losing yourself. It's about finding your purpose. And far from being wandering, isolated loners, transcendentalists believe they are made whole by sharing their life with others. For his part, Thoreau looked to the natural world and therein found God. Sitting on the banks of the Concord River, on his walks to and from his mother's house for supper or for slices of apple pie, Thoreau saw God in the rippling of the water, in the mouth of clams, and in the wings of tanagers. He heard God in the crackle of fires and in the laughter of his friends. Or, as Sigurd Olson would later observe more than a century later, listening points. Places of quiet where the universe can be contemplated with awe. The transcendentalists recognized that one could be alone in the woods and realized that the silence itself addressing you is evidence of an animating spirit of life, one that lives in nature and within each of us as well. For me, being outside and in particular on the water in a canoe is where I feel the landscape itself, where I am my best self. I feel a transcendental balance between humbleness and power. The pandemic disrupted not only a sense of normalcy, but it forced each of us to confront what it means to live disengaged from the immediate or different demands. And while for some, social isolation equates to loneliness and confinement is unbearable, as suffocating as living in a pressure cooker, for others, the reduction of obligations, the opportunity to slow down, to spend more time in the tonic of wildness, and to re-examine what is essential is and can be liberating. So standing atop mountains, along riverbanks, lying awake under star-filled heavens, rocking children, sleeping children, sharing a meal with friends, or experiencing the kindness of strangers, nature is the outward sign of an inward spirit. On August 5th, 1851, Thoreau wrote in his journal, the question is not what you look at, but how you look and whether you see. May it be so.